Okay. In, clap. Uh, intro. Yes. Clap. Okay. There we go. We're going to do it. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> it's about an electric vehicle. Your clap has to be different. What? Yeah. They don't make noise. There you go. Perfect. So Paolo is going to be, oh, he's getting very upset. <laughs> Angry Paolo. Okay. Clap normally. Ha-ha! There's your sound <laughs> reference point. Either that or this. Anyway, welcome to episode, I think, 89 of the Carmagen Show. Part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. That's Jason Camisa. I'm Derek Tam hyphen Scott. And today, tonight, 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 James Cry. Hold on. We can do a Top Gear thing. Oh, no. <clears throat> tonight, I drive a Rimac Nevera. Derek drives a Rimac Nevera and nobody crashes it yet. Yet. Are you driving it again? Uh, no. Oh, good. Okay, we're done. We can definitely say we both drove a Rimac Nevera. And, and no one, neither of us crashed it. Did shit my pants a bit. Oh, well, you should probably get that uh, resolved. I, it's going to be a long threw, podcast. Threw them out the Hang window. on tight, everyone. It's a 2,000 horsepower car, and I don't know if you've noticed, but it's sort of the end of the world me- world meteorologically here For in us. California at the moment. For us, yes. Um, but well, sit back, relax, fasten your safety belt, keep your head firmly planted on the headrest so you don't get whiplash because this thing's a wild keep ride. Keep your tray tables and... Seat backs right in their position. upright and locked positions and uh, close your side, Kurt. I don't know. Don't forget your oxygen mask. Boom. Tragedy. Paolo learned his lesson and then unlearned his lesson. Forgot. I mean, he gets it sometimes. He catches whatever absurd starting point okay. we... Rule for this episode: Put down no, no, water. No, no, no. <laughs> Do not drink when I'm about to say something offensive. You learned that last time. Uh, if you start to get warm because it went from being minus 700 in here to plus 700 in here, uh, let, just do like a hot, like a menopausal woman hot flash thing, and I'll turn the AC down. Okay. Heat down. This doesn't have to be part of the episode. Great. What is it currently set to? 76. Well, that's a little excessive. Can we do like 70? All right, I'll do 72, and I'll turn off turbo for sound. Ready? I no longer hear the turbocharger. Uh, do you know how many comments there were about people missing my singing? Yeah, I was surprised. What is wrong with these people? I don't know. Someone even said we harmonized, which was completely by chance. I I mean, I guess two discordant notes can be a harmony. I don't think we were, either one of us was a I certainly wasn't. I have no position to judge whether you are. Gifted um, in the... Uh, Singing, I did. Since gifted is no, no, no. Whether we you are on key. Well, we. Th- oh God, no heavens. Um, we can. So we no can. singing today. <laughs> Hold on. Is there a song that would be appropriate to the vehicle that we're singing? No, because it's electric. It's quiet. There's out of this world or something like that. Or it is pretty out of this world. I can't drive fifty five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but that applies to a lot of cars, dude. You can't drive one hundred and fifty five in that thing. Yeah. How fast did you go? Difficult to say. There's no police here. Uh, really? You were I don't know. I don't, th- I don't think... I, I definitely didn't go faster than 150. Oh, yeah. No, me neither. It was maybe... Well, 153. Yeah. It happened so I fast. I actually have never driven the car on the highway. <laughs> <laughs> so that 150 was in a school zone. <laughs> Derek. Uh, yes. Yeah, that, it just occurred to me that I have never driven that car. I never, and all the driving I did in the car, I mean, I, I drove it on two separate days, but none, none of it was on the highway. Okay, for, well, here, highway impressions. Carbon, oh, yes. carbon fiber chassis cars are loud, mm-hmm. right? So there's a sort of, it sounds like an insult, but there's a sort of cheapness to, it's a, it's a tinniness maybe. But a it's plasticky. not tinny, it's a sort of, um, yeah, it's, a, there's a, God, how do you okay. describe this? So when you hear noises in a very substantial metal, so a steel chassis car, you get a deep thunk for yeah. a noise. In a plastic carbon tub car, and they're all this way, this is just, it's not an insult, it's an, it's an inherent thing. It's a much higher pitch tink. Yeah, it's like being in your Lotus, but that doesn't... No, yeah. that sounds like shit. This is more... I'm sorry, Lotus. Um, that's I'm just not. The, the car... Well, that's an aluminum chassis with a plastic body on it. What you're hearing is the body and the chassis hitting each other as the whole thing flexes. Carbon cars just have a, a certain timbre, a timbre, 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 timber of it's just a it's a lighter. It's not a lot of bass, and you hear little pebbles and tink, tink, yes. tink, tink, tink all the yeah, stuff. Yeah, a lot of pebble noises. 
so you know you're in a carbon car when you're in a carbon car and there's a it's boomy because you have the the sort of structure resonates i think at a, at a whatever there's a bunch of hollow space in there that's yeah. fairly substantial yeah so on the highway it's reasonably quiet for especially for a for a carbon car and the steering is wonderful it actually you can feel side winds you can feel grade changes and camber and uh, you know a wheel dip on a little bit of a mm-hmm. of a whoop you'll feel it in the wheel i like that or like a, a like an expansion joint you get texture like i made a conscious point when driving this car because i was like well we still haven't specified what it is but i guess we we'll did specify the intro, in the intro right. yes we have already done did that uh that i made a conscious point of driving the car with fingertips only over like and like aiming for potholes or like uh, surface irregularities and i was like i'm getting stuff i'm mm-hmm. actually getting genuine content which you know and it's e-pass yeah most electric power steering filters everything out yeah. um the reason why is the rack is apparently rigidly mounted to the carbon chassis so mm-hmm. there's no bushings and there's nothing to dull that um mm-hmm. so, which means two things number one steering system accuracy under loads you know you don't have the whole rack deflecting in different ways right. but also that v- high frequency vibration that texture from the road really does make it through the wheel and the steering wheel is um alcantara al- is it alcantara or just microfiber i don't know it's al- not leather no, but it's fuzzy. And it's fuzzy. Fuzzy steering wheels do a really good job at helping transmit tactile stuff. I think it's one of the reasons why Porsche GT3s are so much better than regular 911s. One of the many. Mm, interesting. But anytime you get a fuzzy, like an M4 CSL or something, a, a fuzzy steering wheel, steering feels more alive. Yeah, I guess it's more te- more surface area for yeah. your fingertips, effectively. Yeah. yeah. Or more um, three-dimensional surface yeah. that your fingertips are interacting with. Yeah. So you would feel smaller motions than you would on like a slick yeah. surface. I was pleased actually with the steering. I was I thought it was genuinely good, which I am now saying about E Pass. Well, yeah, Here we are. I mean, I, I would say the most you'll ever get out of an E Pass is a seven on this mm-hmm. on the sort of steering scale. Like that's probably upper technical limit. This was there six. Yeah. This was some of the very best E Pass I've ever experienced. Okay. So the one thing that we've left out is that we have, we probably said in the intro, but we haven't recorded that yet. The magic of, of time travel, which we can do. Um, we have not spoken to each other at all about the drive of the yes, Arimats and you, Nevera. And you drove it this morning. Just fresh out of, fresh out of it. I still, I still smell like Rimats. Uh, okay. Borscht. Well, certainly, it's borscht. <laughs> certainly, no, that's the wrong part of I don't the, understand of, the, of the geography. The eastern, east of the, the Alps. Um, and I drove it a couple days last week and we have not commented on it to each other at all. Okay. So you drove it a couple days. You had it for a couple days. Uh, I drove it on two separate days. I'm going to throw this coffee at you because I had a two hour window and it wasn't even, I mean, the roads are shit right now. Yes. They're covered in debris. I don't know if any of you at home have noticed, but California is fucked right now we're in like 15 states of emergency deep yes. after the 12th atmospheric river that just hit us and my favorite oh, i'm gonna have to get an insert on this my favorite was having talk talk to a guy who lives in michigan and he's like oh man you guys have it so easy for winter and i sent him a picture of tahoe where the ski lifts are buried in snow yes <laughs> i was like I've seen yeah, those. a little crazy right now yes it's um, a bit snowy it's a little bit moist yeah we had what another i think another three inches of rain up in the mountains three four inches yes by me yes which means south because the whole the whole Bomb weather system cyclone. was coming in off the coast from the south so santa cruz had to have gotten it yes I didn't. they did yeah yes. and so i, I drove the car right. in the mountains south of san francisco and it was yes. like a fucking war zone yeah there's uh, so yeah there's a bunch of junk out there which actually is an absolutely stellar way to showcase this car in my opinion <laughs> okay you can say that and i can say that because neither of us wrecked it yes but you know, what could possibly go wrong with a 2,000 horsepower torque vectoring all-wheel drive electric 5 million pound, $3 million, I don't even know how much this car costs, car? Like, what could possibly go wrong? Yep. Um, but, okay. but it certainly showcased the sophistication of the uh, powertrain management yeah. and torque vectoring. Yeah. So there, the the torque vectoring, for, th- for those who have bought the bullshit from Porsche, for example, PTV, Porsche torque vectoring, which is brake-based, Torque vectoring is very, very simple. When you have individual control over a left and right wheel on an axle, you then have the ability to turn the car without turning the steering wheel in the same way that you can turn a wheelchair without a steering wheel. Best ex- explanation I've ever come up with. If you turn one wheel faster than the other, you go in the other direction. So right wheel faster would turn you left. You can pull one back. You can do whatever you want. Like a tank. That's another good one. 
Right. They don't have steering wheels, Mm-mm. right? And they're wheels steerable only. wheels. Yeah. Um, same same basic idea. So NSX was the one that really thought, I thought was going to manage this because that's mm-hmm. the, the right form. That's why that car was such a disappointment. Monumental letdown. Because, all right, so you have a mid-engine car, so you have traction over the rear wheels, you have a low polar moment of inertia, you have a center of gravity that's right where it needs to be, and then you can you can manage any instability that you have because of that by torque vectoring at the front axle. And it completely did not do any of that. In Sporty Plus or track mode or whatever it was, it was pretty damn good. But the rest of the time, the car just didn't take advantage of the tools that it was given. The Rimats Nevera, we need to talk about the pronunciation of Rimats. It's Rimats. It's Rimats. That's how they say it. That's how they say it in Croatia. So in America, when I say Rimac, mm-hmm. what's your problem with that? Is it the the C or the R? Oh, the the C at the end is more the problematic. Problematic. Right? I feel like we can all say Rimac, yes. but no one should say Rimac. Yeah, okay. I mean, but what a hell of an uphill battle. Well, we don't say Audi. We say Audi. Yeah, some people say Audi. We don't say Chevrolet. A lot of people say Porsche. Douches. Insert. <laughs> They're subhuman. <laughs> There's a, you know, it's not Porsche, it's Porsche. But um, but that dropping an E here and there, that's bad enough. But we don't say Chevrolet. We don't say Buck, Buick. Um, There's just certain things you're just going to have to learn to pronounce. And if you would like to be an expert in automotive pronunciation, you will call it Rimac. Yes. Uh, worst case, Rimac. But not Rimac. Anyway, um, the Rimac Nevera which was named, do you know how it was named? Yes, it was named after a storm that springs up suddenly in the Mediterranean and then vanishes without a trace and is very strong. And powered by what? Electricity. Yes, lightning. It also means, I learned this, have you learned this yet? Someone has commented it to me that in Nevera? Espanol, mm-hmm. what it means in uh, Spanish? Nevera? It doesn't, it doesn't go or something, right? No, like that's Nova. Like Nova. It no, means it's, fridge. Oh, fridge, that's right, yeah. So, yeah. and in America, all the it Spanish means, speakers are like, "What the fuck, guys?" And in American, it means never. Hmm. This is I when this car came out, I might have made a snarky Instagram post. I'm like, "Yeah, never are gonna happen. Mm, mm. Never are but, going to yeah. happen." Okay. But anyway, at least it's named after wind, and we like cars that are named after wind, like Scirocco and Mistral and Yuraco. Is that a wind? Kamsin was a wind. Kamsin, but Yuraco is a. But Yuraco is a. I don't uh, know what this is. country a Lamborghini in Marrakech. product. <laughs> <laughs> no city. Uh, okay. Right, it's a windy car. It does um, generate wind. Yes, and goes like the wind. Um, okay, so the the Rimac Nevera. The the point is, it has four electric motors, and each obviously motor is individually addressable and controllable, and that's really important, both for deploying and capturing power. Yep. Um, and so this should be guided by the hand of God and should be able to do things that it can't do. Uh, and it does. And it do. Okay, so first things first. From a saleability and overall desirability perspective, let's talk about Rimots for a second. Mm. This is a car company that made its name in a huge crash with Richard Hammond, let's be honest. I can say this because I don't work for, for ECME, which is a the, the U.S. distributor. We are one of the yeah. dealers, yes. Okay. Um I, I would say that Rimouth's uh, defining moment was the crash with Richard Hammond on Top Gear. Interesting. Um, I live in a very different world. Well, that's where the car really became known to the masses. Here's the thing. He didn't get killed. And by all means, he should have been. I mean, that was a really... Uh, it was a big Impressive. Crash. It was an impressive showing for, for a startup. Because you sort of assume that a startup is going to be engineered, you know, like a startup. Yes. The phrase that I always want to use uh, is a car made by a man in a shed. And this car could not be farther away from a car made by a man in a shed. And I've interacted with a lot of those cars. You know, almost like every TVR ever made is a car made by a man in a shed. You know, sometimes that's good. Sometimes the man's drunk, though. Yes, yeah. sometimes the man's yeah. drunk. Blind. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Ramatz is at a point where it's establishing real credibility. First of all, you don't inherit the Bugatti brand unless you know what you're doing. Correct. Be honest, and that, to me, is probably some of the strongest... Um, endorsement you can offer to this company. And I was interacting with someone who was considering a purchase who has owned another cottage supercar that shall remain unnamed. Pagani? No. Sorry, I'm not going to... No. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just not gonna... uh, anyway, he was concerned just about... Tell me within they the... I can tell them. <laughs> what? They heard that. Oh, Sorry. 
Uh, so he was considering the purchase of the You're car. Gonna, Paolo's going to shake his head. He's muting that out. He said Chevrolet. Or similar. Yes. Uh, okay. And he was concerned about the car's reliability because of experience with this other mark. Uh, and I said, I think probably, you know, I can't comment on that because they've delivered two of these cars now. Uh, but oh, Navaras. Navaras, right. yes. Plus the eight uh, C1s, mm-hmm. Concept 1s, their first car. Uh, but the fact that they have sort of buy-in from OEMs and that enough OEMs basically looked at what they were doing, OEMs such as Porsche, who owns, is, I think it's 45 or 55% stake, Mm. Uh, and you know they have contracts with Hyundai Kia, and uh, there's other OEMs. They supply powertrains to uh, Koenigsegg, and uh, oh, that's right, Regera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the fact that they have that much support from OEMs is an indication. You know, yeah. If Porsche looks yeah. at it and says, you know, it would be easier to just buy this than develop something ourselves, absolutely, then that's a high bar. It's a ringing endorsement. Right. I mean, in car companies, the one thing they have to do more than anything else is, is contain liability. Mm-hmm. Look at the billions of dollars that Takata had and to... Dieselgate to... Well, Dieselgate was... One, right. Cause, and that was ultimately a Bosch product, but f- but it was t- tuned by Volkswagen internally. Mm-hmm. The Takata is a direct thing, right? So all these car companies, including Honda and BMW, and I mean, car companies from all over the world use Takata airbags. Well, there's a fault in it. And now that liability is massive. Same thing with ZF, right? ZF is a transmission manufacturer. They, they make transmissions and all, look, all suppliers are like this. And steering racks and stuff like that. If there's a if there's a problem, uh, the OEM is on the hook for it and has to then sue or somehow subrogate, subrogate that right that liability off to someone else. And a com- a company that a small company like Remont's doesn't have the one would think, I don't know what their balance sheet looks like, but wouldn't have the financial. As a large OEM, it's not the kind of risk you want to take. Right. You would rather develop it in-house so you know what it contains and have it built by your known suppliers rather than going to some company that was founded 15 years ago. Exactly. So it has to be an incredibly compelling technical product in order for them to be like, we're willing to like set all that aside right. and partner with these folks to provide us with technology. Right. Yep. So well, I you think- should, You're really good at explaining that. You should just do this podcast yourself because that coffee wasn't strong enough. Oh, do you need to go? Or was it too strong? No, no, it wasn't strong enough. I only got to take a nap. Sorry. Okay. So, you know, the the the, uh, the the proof points that we have are the product itself and the decisions that have been made by manufacturers and the growth of the company. Uh, right. And, you know, the long-term reliability, still uncertain. Listen, we don't know. The toy, there are occasional Toyotas that don't have long-term reliability that's yeah. up to our expectations. But uh, per initial perceived quality. Well, yeah. And, I mean, it's usually easy to smell bullshit. Yeah. Right, the, the standard is so low in terms of a small manufacturers that you can just be like, yeah, it's cute for you know to look at or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's not like a truly compelling product that can compete with, you know, even a largish small manufacturer like Ferrari or Lamborghini or something like that. Right, uh, and this car to me was one of the most impressive sort of small manufacturer thing or even more than than larger manufacturers i think it's a more compelling product in a lot of ways i mean it, it, interestingly enough the only one part in the car that's shared with any other car yes the, i learned this as well i the, thought it was very interesting the, the uh, hvac unit from an audi a4 was it r8 r8 yes um and that's the sort of thing where you think, who cares if an yeah. hvac blower and distribution box doesn't matter clearly the heater is not shared with r8 because that yes. uses engine coolant and this doesn't yes. But um, everything else is calipers. Yeah. I mean, wheels, just knobs in the interior. Mm-hmm. All of it they are making themselves. Yeah, which sounds like suicide from a manufacturer standpoint. It does, but Tesla. So Tesla is a really great comparison here because Tesla also learned that there are just having taking everything done by suppliers. You are not able to innovate. Right. This yes. is the sad reality of yes. modern car companies and no one innovates anything. Oh, so we are debuting rear wheel steering with five degrees in each direction on this new Mercedes Benz and it's the first car in the world to have it. And then mir- miraculously, a year later, every other fucking German car in the world in, in production has it. Oh, and then a year after that, it's every car in the world has it. Well, that's because it's ZF. Or yeah, some other the, supplier. Whatever tier one supplier it was, finally was like, Okay, there's enough demand that we can make billions of the not billions and, but, yeah you know but millions of these units. millions and millions of them and zf was a perfect example look i hold zf in very high regard that 8 hp is the best automatic transmission in the business as far as i'm concerned but there's a reason why everyone has an 8 hp in their car and and not there's no new development in any other way mm-hmm. the car companies flat out told me years ago we can't 
do another um, uh, hydraulic steering system because ZF just won't flat out won't develop it with us. So you can take something existing, but all the tuning has to be done in house and without any support from them. Um, and part of the reason is ZF removed the fire risk of of power steering. Power steering is a huge fire risk because it uses ATF, which is even more flammable, flammable than gasoline under certain circumstances. And so there is a, a much higher risk of fire post crash in a hydraulic steering car. Now, the E-Pass has other benefits. The car can steer itself. There's all this other crap that's going on. But the primary driver was that the, the supplier said no more hydraulic steering. Therefore, even car companies like Ferrari, which got an extension for one generation, had to walk away from it. They have no choice. And so Rimat's doing it all on its own doesn't isn't confined by the engineering of these subsidiaries, just like Tesla, Tesla isn't. And so Tesla's range... After their requirements initially, that they, I mean, they were, they were just sort of like, we'll grab this, it's on the shelf for right. their like shifters, for example. Yeah, but there was stuff that they, they could manage, but mechanical components, I mean, one of the coolest demonstrations that I ever got from, uh, from Tesla, and we'll bounce around, I apologize, we'll come back to the Nevera, obviously, but um, I was talking to, uh, they, they put me in the room with the sort of business guy and the, uh, and the chassis guy at the same time, so the head of engineering, head of driving, basically. Um, and they work together as a team instead of against each other, which doesn't happen at most car companies. Um, and so one of the guys was from Honda and he had said that they, they wanted to develop a low rolling resistance wheel bearing and it costs something like 15 cents per car more per car. Um, and somebody did a K analysis and it wasn't going to bump them up by one, one MPG on EPA. It wasn't going to do anything. So he almost got fired for push, trying to push. He's like, this is a real benefit and it's going to benefit us. Blah, 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 blah. And no one gave a shit. At Honda. At Honda. Comes to Tesla uh, and develops, works with a supplier and metal, but they install Tesla installed its own metallurgist inside that supplier. And they worked and worked and worked and got this wheel bearing, which had a huge reduction, even more so than the Honda part. Um, but it was $15 a corner. So you're talking $60, $60 a car, car. Um, plus development, whatever, all the rest of the stuff. And it got through immediately. And I, and I wrote a column on this when I was at Road and Track, because they they engineer, Tesla engineers cars with a currency called uh, battery bucks. And so the question is, if I can get five miles of range out of extra range out of this car, an efficiency gain, what would it cost if I then did that with a bigger battery, mm -hmm. right? How much in dollars in battery? And a bigger battery, well, that might now push some other componentry over a weight limit. Right, now it has to be re-engineered to be stronger. The whole car gets, it all has to be re-crash tested, this, that, and the other thing. And so they look at terms, and not in terms of $50 or $60 per car for the additional parts, but it would have been hundreds or thousands of dollars to get that efficiency advantage using battery. So yes, to when when honda said 15 cents per car fuck off you're fired versus tesla saying 60 dollars a car do it unequivocally and so tesla's continual improvement on model s for example which is now 712 years old um is coming from things like that where they're really thinking about and they're pushing on the suppliers that they now have relationships with tesla didn't have those relationships 10 years ago and so no one was going to be willing to work with them certainly not tire companies or anyone else who all do now but tesla was able to solve for example for model s failing drive-by noise regulations which is absurd but it's an electric car but it, it gathers speed so quickly that it was going so fast by the end of the of this little test window that it failed noise well tesla worked together with michelin to install foam inside tires to make this you know ultra quiet tire that's the drawback of working with all these OEMs is like, this is good enough for Mercedes. It's good enough for Porsche. It's good enough for these guys. Remounts doesn't have that. They can go start to finish and develop their own car. And it probably ultimately saved them more, uh, saved them a tremendous amount of time because they would never time have been able to, sure. right? Yeah. They would have never been able to pull off a car that can do what this car does with 2000 horsepower. Yeah. Well, nearest makes no difference. Um, in the same way that Tesla would never look at, Go to epa.gov, which is a fuel economy EPA site, and have it list out the most um, the most efficient cars that are on sale in the last five years or two years or whatever it is. And the, the list starts with Tesla Model S or Model 3, I think it is. And it's just Tesla, 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 Tesla. 23 of the top 25 cars on the list are Teslas, making these numbers up, but it's they're all there. And these aren't shitty little economy cars. They're cars that will destroy a BMW M4 in acceleration and cornering and braking and around a racetrack, right? And the reason for Tesla, one lap, 
for one lap. Um, but the reason that Tesla's doing is able to do that is because they're not working with suppliers and they're thinking outside the box and doing things differently. Um, so, or they're empowered to do so because they don't have to be at the mercy of the suppliers. Right. So that was interesting to, to get into Navera and see nothing recognizable from any other car, not the door pulls, no. none of the controls feel the same. Like, you, you know, this is all bespoke stuff. Yeah. And UX, that whole, the infotainment screen is totally bespoke, never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. um, is it incredibly responsive and fast? No. Do I care? No, it's getting Apple CarPlay in a future, a future generation. That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that I thought was interesting structurally the way the car was built what 30,000 newton meters per degree of torsional 70. rigidity 70 I'm sorry 70,000 newton meters per degree of torsional rigidity yes compared to a GT3 or GT2 I think they said was around 30. 30 yeah 30 is a sort of high bar where you don't get much higher than 30 yeah. um you know and, and if I remember correctly 991 was 30,000 for a closed 911 15 for a Targa and 10 for uh, a 911 convertible and this is 70 yeah like, comparable to a Le Mans prototype right. apparently yeah so you're dealing with an and I was also interested to learn that because the the shape of the battery and it's sort of the way that it's bonded to the structure or attached to the structure that the uh, it increases by 37 yeah. percent uh the structural rigidity mm -hmm. to have the battery installed versus not I mean I guess that's probably similar if you looked at Tesla, Tesla it would be the same thing because that that, right. that huge battery pack is a stressed member but the battery pack in this car weighs 700 kilos uh, I think it was 600 kilos, 650. Okay, some, I mean, huge amount of weight. Now, with that said, powertrain in a Bugatti Veyron, which, or a Veyron, so Chiron's probably the same, was 1,600 pounds for mm -hmm. the engine transmission. Yeah. So, you know, it's, oh, this is insane. This is so heavy. Well, when you're talking about that kind of power output, it's not really that nuts. Yeah. Um, and uh, the f reality is the car feels quite light on its feet. Mm -hmm. That was a big concern of mine was that, you know, you look objectively at the weight of the car and you think, my God, I mean, this thing weighs mm -hmm. almost 5,000 pounds, uh, but it doesn't drive like it. That's because weight is something you can com almost completely mask. There's a lot more, Almost completely, yeah. yes. There's a lot more benefits to weight than there are drawbacks, strangely enough, right? To go drive a 4,000 pound car, it will have a much more solid structure. You can really slow down jerk. So yes. rate of change of acceleration, which is what we feel is a bump, right? right. You can, the more weight, the, the, the lower the jerk moments are, are on all these cars. <laughs> Just make your jokes now. Um, uh, I mean, jerk is an actual physics an actual term. Physics thing. It's the second, so acceleration is the first derivative of speed and jerk is the first derivative of that or the right. second so derivative jerk. of speed. Also, anyone in the left lane in front of me. It's also on. a jerk. Anyone on the road, also a jerk. Yes. Um, yeah, so the reason why big, large cars, one of the reasons why big, large, heavy cars ride so well is because of that mass. You can slow down the reactions of, of everything. Um, and you can compensate for weight with bigger bearings, bigger brakes, bigger tires, bigger, all this other componentry. And it becomes this sort of never-ending expansion of stuff, which mm -hmm. is why Lotus's lightness philosophy is is to be rewarded. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff about weight. Key point, when it's where you want it to be. Yes. And with an electric car, you can put it kind of wherever you want. Mm -hmm. and um, this car certainly reflects that. Yeah. does. So there's, first of all, all of the modern Ferraris are fat pigs, right? I just, I just weighed an F8 Spider, and I think it was 3675, 36 and change. Um, it's actually lighter pounds. than I was expecting. Yeah, way lighter than I was expecting because they're all, who, the problem with all the Italians is they're full of shit. You just never know what the cars are. They give you this dry weight figure, which is like, well, which we fill like, the it tank doesn't with have helium. a battery. And yeah. Oh yeah, it doesn't have a battery. It doesn't have a fucking seat. It doesn't have a motor in it. But um, these cars are heavy. 3,600 pounds for, for a, an ultra lightweight, all aluminum sports car is quite a lot of weight. Um, but they don't, yeah, especially feel against the GT3, which is what 31, 32. Or yeah. The, uh, there's a huge difference. And so, but you don't feel it. Ferraris feel massless because yes. they're managing that weight properly. Yeah. And then it's the miracle of modern suspension and whether you have magnetorheological shocks and the, the way that tires work and also st rigidity of the structure. Yep. If you have a more rigid structure, then you can put softer suspension on it and then it rides better, even though it might be, you know, quite a stiff what, platform. Right. Mm -hmm which is, I love that trick. And this car, the Nevera really feels that because it has such a rigid structure, mm -hmm. the ride quality, that was another thing I wanted to comment on is the incredible ride quality of this car for yeah. something that is this sure footed. And well, and capable of these speeds. Yeah. I mean, I think it's limited to three something on the road because probably kilometers. Because, uh, kilometers yeah. 
um, yeah, you know, yeah. I think if you have an something. unrestricted uh, sort of tune <laughs> calibration, <laughs> yeah. it's 256 miles an hour, right? 240k, uh, 420k, yes. um, which is <laughs> ridiculous. But yes. anything that has to be able to maintain that speed also then has to have stiff enough sidewalls and whatever. And there's a lot of there's a lot of compromises baked in. And they're in. just running this car on four S's. Yes, four S's, right? <laughs> Our favorite tires in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my drive was on wet roads mm-hmm. um, with tons of branches and needles. I mean, the, the road was just blanketed in detritus. Yeah, um, basically tree bits. Tree bits, and it was fine. Yeah. Like, so the crazy thing is uh, I, I got a ride to the base of the road, so the introduction ride by one of the em- employees of Remots, and he, on, the, on a closed course, on a runway with definitely no traffic all around me, um, all around us, floored it in the complete soaking wet um, and didn't put his hands on the wheel from 20 until a large amount of three-digit miles per hour and the yeah. car never moved. Yeah. The car was dead straight. Yeah, because it, was, it is able to read the traction in each corner and allocate power. And it's really fun when the car is in track mode. There's a thing that displays how many newton meters of torque is being deployed by each motor. And if you do it on a section of road, because we we did the same thing on a, at a time when the right wheels were on wet and the left wheels were on dry. Oh, no shit. Exactly the same result. And if you watch the numbers, it's like, obviously it's metering down based on how much traction it has on each side. But the car did exactly the same thing with half of it wet and half of it dry. Oh, that's so cool. It was cool. absolutely spectacular yeah. as a, just a feat. It's fit. The car is, the whole entire car is physics defying. But, but, right. And here's the thing. So is Tesla, right? This is the, the amazing thing. You drive a Tesla Plaid and you are just, you will not believe what it can do because Tesla's traction control is so fast and so predictive and so good that you would genuinely swear you can drive a plaid and you, you swear up and down. There's no stability and traction control happening at all. Turn that shit off. You will hit a tree. It's fucking over immediately. The car's uncontrollable. And so I really appreciate what Tesla does in, in that sense, but you don't have any idea what's going on in this car. You know what's going on because they've allowed just enough wheel slip to get the car a little bit sideways, and you can hear it and you can feel it. Mm-hmm. But holy shit, does it actually just deliver? And unlike Tesla, it wasn't tuned by a bunch of computer nerds. Yes. the people who did this chassis definitely know how to tune a car. Yeah, that's amazing to me. Yeah, to me, it feels this is going to be such a strange thing to say about a five thousand pound car. But it feels the way that I always wanted an Elise to feel. Well, I drove my Elise to the uh, to drive the Nevera, and I will say they don't feel the same in any way, shape, or form. So you're gonna have a little <laughs> bit of explaining to do. Um, it's the agility. It's mm-hmm. the way the car changes direction in such the, the 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 things about those cars that remind me of each other is the way that the cars change direction so instinctively in in such a sort of. No fuss, no muss, no nonsense. There's, there's, it feels disintermediated, which is absurd because it's actually incredibly intermediated by all of the systems in the car. But because they are calibrated so well, it is, it really like replicates exactly the experience of a car that's super transparent. Right. Like the best example there, if any of you guys ever have the opportunity to go drive any Porsche with rear wheel steering and drive any BMW with rear wheel steering. Mm. Porsche, you don't notice anything. You just in a parking lot, whether it's parking lot or drifting around a corner, the car just does exactly what you want, when you want, how you want, and in the measure that you've asked for. Mm. And then the BMW horks itself sideways, scares the shit out of you and your passengers, makes everyone in the back sick. And you're like, what the fuck is this car on casters? It's horrendous. Mm. And that's the difference between having the same part. Because remember, ZF said to everyone, now you have rear steer and every german car company has to have rear steer it's all in the tuning and the same Mm -hmm. thing with this car it interestingly feels turns very differently in different modes because yes sport holy hell yeah sport does not have the same uh turn in as race because sport so as oh you got it with the updated calibration i didn't drive it with the updated calibration oh so they had a very like um short leash calibration when Mm -hmm. i drove it i guess the previous dealer that had it had requested that for test drives Mm -hmm because this car had been shunted in the past on a test drive. Can't imagine why. 2000 horsepower. horsepower, yeah. So anyway, I got a calibration that really frustrated me, and apparently they dialed that out for you, so I'm glad you experienced it. Oh, no, form. everything was clear right the fuck off. Totally off. So you have range mode, and then you have cruise, cruise, then sport, then race, then drift. Drift, yeah. Okay, drift mode? Um, it works. If, <laughs> as advertised... <laughs>
it however didn't like my fuckery so i do i'm always doing tricks Mm -hmm. um uh, where, you know, I'll stab the gas and then use the brake to slow down rotation and drag brake while I give gas to, you know, to, to slow. Like the a rally front. car. Yeah. Oh, I just dropped my laptop. Hold on. <laughs> it's, well, the, the background is still up, so you couldn't have dropped it too hard. I just fell. And at some point this was just going to go to like, you're going to see my emails. and <laughs> Dear Sarah. It's going to be all caps. In, in, what the fuck? Signed Karen. <laughs> um <laughs> But uh, yeah, so <clears throat> drift mode works as advertised, but I was doing little tricks and I was told enthusiastically by the, the, the lovely test driver. Factory test driver. Factory test driver. Like, dude, just fucking trust it and floor it. And I'm like, <laughs> not today, bitch. I am not going to be the one that wrecks your $2 million car. It is not happening. It's $2 million, right? Two, 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 f- two point something. Starting. Yeah. yeah. So I wasn't about to try that, but wow, does it get sideways? And when you're in drift mode, you have absolutely no traction or stability control. It's 100% off. Mm-hmm. And you and can it, independently turn those things off in other modes as yes. well. Yes. Um, but because the front motors are so much, because the rear motors are so much more powerful than the fronts, they're just all on at 100%. So it's mm-hmm. not like this thing where it's helping you go 100% rear first and then adding front. It's consistent. He's like, you just have to trust, just fucking nail it. And I, I couldn't do it. I wasn't going to do yeah, it. Yeah, because it feels like, uh, I don't know. It is the most unsavory thing. It's like being at the limit in a 911 and someone telling you to stand on the brakes. Yeah. You're just not going to do it. You're going to go into orbit if you do that. I would do it, but there were curbs and trees and fucking no, I just wasn't going to do that. I, I do. He drifted a couple corners, like very low speed, kind of, kind of come to stop. I trust him. It works. I can't wait to try this car somewhere where I can hit something. But there, the difference between the sort of cruise mode and, um, and race mode is they're using torque vectoring to actually help turn the car. Mm-hmm. And it's, I think... I don't want to say it's too much, but it's, there's a lot more in the in the upper modes. And so there's one dynamic flaw that I it, I don't even want to call it a flaw, a characteristic that I would probably ask to change if I were in charge. Two. Let me think. I'm sure I'll think of a third one because I always bitch about everything. Um, it is that the weight of the steering. So there's, there's quite a bit of dead zone in the center of the steering. You need that on a car yes. that's capable of this much speed, right? You need yes. to be able to just not sneeze and wind yes. up in the tree. Um, it's perfect. It, it's exactly what it needs to do. However, the effort build curve, if you can imagine plotting out the re- steering response in terms of G lateral G um, and the effort curve sort of starts in advance of that. So there's, you have a little tiny dead spot and then it starts to ramp up an effort. So weight of the steering before the car starts to react. And so as you turn in, it gets heavier and then you're out of the meat. I, I asked, I said, listen, I don't, I don't know what the decision was on this, but I, I would like to have a little bit of less weight in that dead zone. What it will do is highlight the dead lo- dead zone and make it more noticeable for, for, for drivers. But I have, I find that I'm making little corrections that are a little bit, <clears throat> a little bit less than perfectly smooth because those two curves aren't lining up. And the second one was just in the lesser modes. I think, uh, Remots could get closer to Tesla's predictive uh, traction control because what you do is you get a wheel brake followed by slip. It'll pull back power. Now it's not using Bosch ABS traction control like everything else does, where it smacks you on the hand. You wait, you know, one rubber baby buggy bumper, one Mississippi, two Mississippi if you, if eons before you get the power back. It's there pretty quick, but because it'll allow the wheel spe- speed to flare first, it then has to allow it to come back down and then go, and that costs you some time. Mm-hmm. You don't ever feel that in Teslas. You just fucking go. Mm-hmm. Um, the answer to that was that we sort of kind of did this on purpose because the car has 2,000 horsepower yes. and we need to make sure people realize they're at the limit of adhesion. Yeah. Okay. That's a fair point and I have no counter argument to that other than, <laughs> well, couldn't you just put like a big screen up? Like turn the whole instrument cluster orange and like bitch your fucking slipping tire here. But I, you probably wouldn't notice that when you're seeing red and, you know, 2,000. Well, yes, and I think they're charge. trying to keep people under control, fundamentally. Mm-hmm. That's the goal. Right. Well, fair enough. But and, and that is actually one of the stated goals of the car, is that they wanted to make sure that it was a car that, despite having 1,900 horsepower, could be driven by anybody at any speed. Yeah. And to feel safe at most any skill level to floor the car, which, you know, you do for at least instantaneously. I mean, it gathers speed in such a remarkable way. I don't, I don't know that I would trust anyone. I don't yeah, know if I'd be in right. the passenger seat of that car. Yeah. And here's the reason why. The car's got it. Like, you know, the demonstration of letting go of the steering wheel and flooring, it sounds like it's something negligent to do, but it was a really good thing for me to see mm-hmm. because that means I don't have to correct. Mm-hmm. My corrections are going to come in so much later than what the car is that 
the car does that there's the risk is that I as a driver I'm going to get behind it. The car starts to yaw this way, I throw correction in this way. Right, and then you get you you get a, a oscillation that you're actually exacerbating as a tank slapper. Exactly. Effectively. And then you see that all the time on YouTube. I made the mistake of watching a couple of like fail blog crash videos and now all my whole Instagram feed is nothing but like <laughs> fuckery on the road it's awesome and i love it but like now i'm like every time i leave the house i'm like i'm gonna get struck by a fucking asteroid like there's <laughs> or a bmw m4 exactly <laughs> but there's like all these people are like you're so you're three seconds behind the car fucking correct mm-hmm. and i just that's exactly what would happen in this car and so even though i feel like there's a that the car's got it i would actually like a mode that i, I guess cruise mode really dials the horsepower back yeah, and it's, it's substantially front wheel drive, I think, in that mode also. It needs, to be. it needs to be because it's just a friggin' weapon and it's no, nothing to the car's detriment, right? I mean, really nothing. I mean, it is um, the friendliest 1900 horsepower car I think you could ever yeah. hope for. I'm, I'm trying to think of other cars that I've driven that are as fast. Chiron. Chiron Pure Sport was same league mm-hmm. of fast. Once it's By moving, the, once, once it's moving, once it's moving. Yeah. yeah, and in the real world, there's just no contest that Bugatti would yeah. be left behind like it was a GTI. Um, yeah, I mean, in the numbers, apparently, fastest accelerating car ever, production car ever, is one point eight five to sixty or something like that. And is that on prepped surface though? Uh, no, no, I don't believe so. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was the quarter was eight fifty eight mm-hmm. at. I don't remember 170 it's miles an hour there, or yeah. something like that. I mean, just asinine. I was figures. supposed to inside baseball. I was supposed to get one to do an ultimate drag race replay one, and it, through no fault of anyone's, we just couldn't get the timing to work. But I really wanted to race that against a sapphire and you know that lucid because that is previously the fastest production accelerating production car of all time. Um, and I'm not sure as if Navara is fully homologated for street use yet in the U.S. Um, uh, I think they are like weeks away, reportedly. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see which one comes first, because if I think sapphires are being delivered. So if sapphires, if if indeed they are, then if they're fully homologated, they win first. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, sapphire is a very different thing. It's a five thousand five passenger, big, huge luxury sedan that almost keeps up with this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really wanted to do a, an episode where we just built up. Like, okay, you think. This is fast. So let's put your mom in this in the back seat and floor it and see what she says. And like, you know, I just put, put my mom in the back of it. She's got she's got Italian mom Tourette's when you floor it. She starts hitting anything under about a six sec, five second, zero to 60. And the, the fists start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just kind of wanted to build up like, hold on. You think this is a fast car? Hold on. Watch this get its ass kicked by that. Yep. And then that and then yep. that and then that. And then that's kind of what needs to happen because there's no other way anyone can possibly understand how fucking fast this car is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I mean the fast part is even perhaps the least interesting part. Once you pass a certain point, the fastness to me becomes irrelevant. Uh, we are well yeah. past that we are point, well past that point, honestly. And so then I, you you say, okay, well, what else does a car do? And you know, one of the common questions that people ask me about it is, you know, is it fun? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's very impressive. Mm-hmm. The thing I struggle with with that car is the same thing I struggle with any car that does. You know, zero to sixty in three and a half seconds. Honestly, even still, is in this territory. It's a car that is has so much potential and capability. Broken record, blah blah blah. So you'll exactly never get what to you, use. you never get to use it. You never get to experience the car's limits. And it was interesting to talk to the test driver because he's been like one of the primary development drivers for this car for his entire life. He's put seventy five thousand kilometers on these cars. Mm-hmm. He reported, and it shows when you ride with him because he just has this confidence and it's the same thing that happens to me like with a a very fast motorcycle is that initially it is so overwhelming that you can't even process what's happening Mm -hmm. but if you do it every day and then it starts to sort of you become inured to it and you can actually start processing what's unfolding at that speed and he was clearly at that place and i was very clearly not i just (laughs) don't have that kind of experience in cars that fast uh, and so he was comfortable with its limits and using them and stuff. But he's also, you know, described some of the stuff that he's done with the car and the way that he can use the car. And you just can't do that here. You know, the ideal road for that car is a very fast sweeping B road, effectively, with straightaways where you go 300, as he described it, which is a straightaway where I would go 75 right. in a regular car. Uh, and, you know, how many people are going to do that and how many people live near a road where you can really exercise this car and this is just the the hyper car conundrum generally i, mean, I had to tell him a couple of times like you know over 100 in california is jail like they can really arrest you if and you have a foreign like, license i think 
my point was actually to him was that it wasn't that I didn't trust him or the car. And he didn't go he, twice. I asked him like, and it was in the one forties and one fifties, like he, slow down. And the reason why is not because I didn't trust him or the car. It's because no one on the road expects anything to be coming at those kind of speeds. Yeah. When 100 is the, is the mark where you go to jail, no one's touching that. Yeah. And I, I don't, I, I can't think of how the last time I saw another car on a public road doing a hundred, much less 130, 140, 150 miles an hour in traffic. It just, it gets there like that. Yeah, I don't see, especially with the calibrations and skill levels of American motorists. What's, and, what skill level? Yeah, precisely. Okay. <laughs> exactly that. And so it was yeah. uh, one of those things, even if you have the road to yourself, I just didn't really care to have that much speed differential no. between the speed I'm going through a corner and, and the, the speed that I'm approaching a corner. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so well, yeah. Well, I mean, just yeah. that, that like, I'm not used to just standing on the brakes really hard for a couple seconds before I enter a corner. I just don't go on roads that fast. You no, know, no, the, the, the joy way. is yeah. in a corner, not mm -hmm. on a straightaway. And so, it, you know, is it engaging to drive? Yes, it's engaging for a different reason, not because you have the references of, of RPMs and what gear you're in which i as it turns out i use a shitload of oh, because yeah. when i was driving this car on a twisty road i was just like i why do i feel so disoriented yeah. it's because you don't know have rpms and you don't have gear selection mm -hmm. as a reference point for a corner and all you have is miles per hour yep. and that i felt a little bit sort of like naked or underprepared mm -hmm. for corners because i just didn't have enough sort of uh reference points that mm -hmm. i'm used to having in a combustion car that and the fact that the difference in speed between you know V max on a straight and a corner is so tr huge, huge that it just it's so it engages you in that sense mm -hmm. because you're starting to do calculus or I'm, I was starting to do calculus that I don't normally do when I'm driving quickly on a mm -hmm. on a good road uh, and so yeah it is engaging but it's a different type of engagement right for me anyway if you're shaving off 120 miles an hour between peak peak straight speed and corner speed the chances of anything going horribly terribly emergency room life flight wrong are just through the roof and i have yeah. no and there's sur irregular surfaces and shit on the roads and bumps like yeah, no. you like notice bumps on roads that you had no idea were there because at 50 or 70 miles an hour you don't notice them but at, at higher at speeds to that, yeah. yeah well you, you and your and my driving style tends tend to be very similar when we're on back roads doing terrible things we don't peek out i mean there were, I, I, there were a couple times over the years that we've done rallies and we're laughing that we never really even went over the speed limit yep. you know we never went fast enough to get any significant ticket and mm -hmm. meanwhile we get out we're shaking we're sweating the cars are smoking we're having like <laughs> like i need a post rally <laughs> cigarette and it's like what, what was your peak speed 61 like yeah. ooh, ah. um so we tend to feel the same way about that so i said it's too much power and and the test driver laughed he was funny but it was great really genuinely one of the one of my most fun experiences was with factory drivers because sometimes they, yeah they were very uptight mm -hmm. um but he was he was not he's i said too much power and he goes there is never such a thing and i said there is with internal combustion engines and but there's not with electric cars yeah, That's something I really never thought about. Yes, because, because of the uh, traction control and the ability to modulate power. Not even that. Not, uh, and pace. Not even that. In an electric car, you don't know what's left on the table. So if I got in that car mm -hmm. and reduced it to 250 horsepower and floored it, that car has no fake engine noise, which I love. No fake noise at all inside the car. You're hearing bearings and gears and windings and cool yeah, shit. Yeah, you hear a little bit of chuntering from the drivetrain yeah. when you pull up to stops. Yep. And as I as I imagine, it's disengaged. I don't even know what that noise is, but it's a noise that I've heard before in a car and I like yeah. it. Yeah, no, uh, it's some kind of, of drivetrain noise. It talks noise. to you. It talks yeah, to you. Yeah, and it, you hear the... the <laughs> I posted a video of somebody... To, I sent it to one of my friends. He said, it sounds like you're riding a, a light rail vehicle because it's just electric motor <laughs> yeah. noises. Yep. But like as a trainer, and I'm like, oh, it's kind of a cool noise. Yeah. And of course, most importantly, it's authentic. It's, it's real. That's exactly what I loved about it. But if I limited that car to 250 horsepower or 400 horsepower, five or six or nine or 12, you wouldn't know the difference as a driver. You just hear that same and the thing takes off and it goes. And you're like, wow, this is slow, medium, fast. Doesn't yes. matter. In an internal combustion engine, you know exactly, an ICE car, you know exactly what you're leaving on the table because you have a red line on that tachometer. And if you're especially driving some pilot ship modern turbocharged automatic isolation box, you pull out from a light and you're you're in your E63 AMG wagon and it's blah, 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 blah. You're in ninth gear by the time you're moving 30 miles an hour. It's never gone over 1400 RPM and the car is bored. Mm -hmm. Versus when you floor it, you get this scream of revs, this, you know, this crackle on the upshifts. And so on an internal combustion engine car, I want it to be as slow as I possibly can. 
there's a limit, but but a sl- yeah, but you do own a beat, so the limit is very low. It's very low, sixty three horsepower. <laughs> but it, the thing is, I weighed it by the way. One thousand. Hold on. Do you want to guess what the beat weighs? Did I tell you this? You did already. Shit. Do you remember what it was? Thirteen eighty six. Sixteen eighty three. Sixteen eighty three. I had all the right numbers yeah. in the wrong place. One thousand six hundred and eighty three horsepower uh, pounds. <laughs> Jesus, pounds and uh, sixty three US sixty four metric horsepower. Okay, it's slow. But the thing about it is, it if this was an electric car that did 13 seconds to 60, I wouldn't have it. I didn't wouldn't want it. I wouldn't enjoy any part of it. Because again, the difference between zero and full throttle is the difference between and like doesn't matter, right? Driving, we all love to drive a car flat out. Driving a slow car fast is one of the greatest pleasures in the world, especially if it's a rental car. Um, <laughs> and and you really miss out on something. That's not the case with EVs. So I don't think 2,000 horsepower is too much because, frankly, the the chassis can handle it. The brakes seem to be able to handle it. Blended brake feels great, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, And all all systems were sort of designed for this. But I think internal combustion engines, I'm done with, with the modern sort of generation of ICE automatic turbocharged cars. They're bored. I'm bored. With and that sucks. Torque peaks under 2000. Yeah. You just never get to exercise the car. I don't care. I wouldn't care that I never get to exercise this car um, because I'm not missing out because on something. Because there's no reward to doing so. Other than G-forces. Mm-hmm. And so you can sort of merge onto the freeway at a normal speed and like, oh, there's an opening in the traffic a quarter mile ahead. And you're there. Yes. That's cool. Yeah. That's so on the way out, Francesco, owner of ECME, who friend of mine and loves to give me shit, introduces me to the Rimats folk as, oh, this guy hates hypercars. Yeah, because there's nothing more annoying than some screaming V12 that I can't ever experience more than once because it redlines in first gear at 121 miles an hour and second gear brings you to 240 and then, you know, you have seven other gears afterwards. Oh, and it's an automatic. Oh, and it's a turbocharged. Fuck that. Mm-hmm. Um I don't hate this car as a hypercar because it redefines speed, first of all. Like any, I don't give a shit what internal combustion engine, anything you're driving, fuck off. You have no chance. You're gone. That's all true. Redefine speed. There is no, absolutely nothing you're missing out on by keeping up with normal traffic. Um, And it all just works together in a very different way. And because of the way the car is tuned, it doesn't feel like a video game, doesn't feel like a simulation, doesn't feel like a spaceship where you're like all this fake noise coming out of it yep. it's authentically a hypercar it is a i mean yes you can tell it was developed by car people to solve all of the shortcomings of internal combustion but fundamentally yep. leave the dna of being a car enthusiast mm-hmm. car intact yep and what, so for that i very much respected it what don't you like about it um i just i will i it will never for we already talked about how it's just so fast on a back road that where can you ever exercise it fully? And I guess the question is you you just don't, you don't exercise it fully. And so you have to enjoy it the way that, you know, for what you can do with it. And there's a lot of cars that I do like even just tooling around in, whether it's an air-cooled 911s, the F50 is like this. You know, you don't have to be using all of the F50's capability to have a good time just mm-hmm. because there's such an experience and so much texture to it you know a lot of great automotive experiences are like that and so you know this car it is too fast for me uh it's you know too cool for this world and as you say i knew you were going to do that that's that's that german song that by the fantastischen feel that i told you about so yeah. by yeah. but and that and that's kind of so that that aspect of it you know i can get around that i mean that's a silly complaint to make anyway and at least there's a good experience when you're not using all of the car's capability um, I don't know. You you just start to really pick nits, I guess, right. which means there's not much I don't like about it, other than that it's not a carbureted manual transmission, naturally aspirated mm-hmm. car, which it's just not ever going to be. Right. Uh, and so if you treat it as an electric vehicle, I, the thing that I I came away with this car from was, man, I just want to drive this everywhere. It's kind of the way I feel about motorcycles, about how it exempts you from sort of certain things where you can just be superhuman and and violate physics. And there's something really wonderful about violating physics. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this car does that. So it's, I think it's a wonderful daily driver. The fact that it doesn't beat you up if you were to cover long distances, and it's not particularly, it, it doesn't assault you really in any way, except for with accelerated forces. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's not a fatiguing car to drive. They, they developed it as a car that, 
And actually, I identify what I feel like are some strange philosophical parallels between this car and a McLaren F1, which is that duality. Like, what kind of compromises are you choosing to make as an engineer on this car? Mm -hmm. The compromises, you know, the the mission that was set out for the McLaren F1 is that this is a car that you would drive to Monaco. You know, it's a car you spend all day long in, yet also delivers mind-bending performance in terms of what the world is expecting a car should do at Mm -hmm. a particular moment in time Mm -hmm. uh, and practical and livable and usable and an experience at kind of all speeds and so i was like that's weird that i would i draw a parallel with the mclaren f1 but the way that they were choosing to make compromises because he said it's an ev but we didn't really focus much on efficiency at all oh at all yeah like Uh, he said it mattered at all yeah, it was not a factor in their mm-hmm. decision in, in any engineering decision that they mm-hmm. made in the car, mm-hmm. nor was really packaging. You know, the F1 actually is packaged probably more cleverly or or more um, balanced for usability because it seats three people and has more luggage space. Does it really seat three, though? I mean... Um, I mean, because your shoulders are staggered mm-hmm. from each other, it, it seats three as comfortably as it seats two, I guess. Fair enough. I <laughs> mean, I think to say this that car the people, probably... the outer passengers are equally uncomfortable. Right. I would say the least comfortable aspect about the McLaren F1 is f- around your feet. Mm-hmm. The footwell feels a little too close mm-hmm. for if you're a passenger. And uh, th- there's enough space for your shoulders, but maybe like a little short on hip space. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, so it seats two as, as comfortably as it seats three people, right. the McLaren F1. That's what I'm thinking. This car seats two, two more comfortably than a McLaren F1 seats two. Yes. Yeah. That's definitely true. Uh, I think we're also used to like a lot of trunk space in EVs, right? We're used yes. to like a lot of... Yeah, and, oh, and so they were like, well, we're going to put the battery exactly in the right place for weight distribution. Mm-hmm. We're going to put the motors where we would like them to be for dynamic reasons. And so every decision that they're making in terms of compromise uh, was oriented towards like delivering either performance or dynamics in some mm-hmm. way, as opposed to like, you know, packaging for large amounts of luggage or carrying people or right. or even like luxuriousness. It rides very nicely, but really nice you know, thing. it's not a luxury car by any means Mm. and so the place where they chose or what what they chose as their north star when they were saying what compromises do we want to make is a place that's very petrol headed Mm. even though the car has no petrol yeah um it it becomes i i I sort of agree with you i sort of how do i say this without being a dick what didn't you like about the car I don't love this styling language and it's not, it's nothing to do with this car. I don't like the sort of hypercar shape. I've never been a sports car guy. Right. Yeah. Um, I always love the sort of big, tall dork wolf and sheep sheep's clothing. And so this is not a dig on the car. This is just an explanation of my own personal things within that realm. How do you feel the car scores? I think it looks okay. Um, I think it it's inoffensive, which is huge yeah. because there's a lot of, there are a lot of things in that realm that, oof, it looks offensive. Right. It looks purposeful. It doesn't look gaudy. It doesn't look overdone. It's not overwrought. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's restrained and it's it does exactly what it needs to do. I just couldn't help but th- think to myself, wow, what if you could make this perf- level of performance and and drivability and usability in a shape that had a big trunk and a back seat? <laughs> and I was like, this would make the world's best fucking wagon. <laughs> I know I'm weird. But you say, well, this is the kind of car that I just want to get in and drive everywhere. Well, you know, I don't really want to have to deal with front end lift. It's a front end rear li- end lift. Certainly didn't scrape anywhere. Like yeah. that was an issue. And I was doing like sort of weird three point turns to do multiple passes mm-hmm. of the camera. I never had an issue once with the yeah. front end. Ever. Yeah, I think that's cool. But yeah. give me a dorky taller shape that maybe I could just use every day. And I would. And yeah. I, I don't think that really but means But even that. in its current form, it makes a wonderful daily yeah. car because it is so... Sort without of a trunk. Un- without without a trunk, right. effectively, yeah. Because it is so undemanding mm-hmm. and sort of all of the pain that comes with trying to use... You know, it is the anti-Countach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I mean... I, as a car, I happen to adore, but also anytime I interact with a car like that, you know, after an hour or two, I'm like, get me out of this thing and I don't want to see it again for three weeks. Okay, that raises a good question. So I love cars like that. Right, cars that just burn you out. You never want to see it again. You, you know, you get sort of the description that I always give is you get in the car and you're like, this is going to be an experience, and I'm going to make it for you know half an hour, and it's going to be direct. Ten minutes later, you hate the fucking car, mm-hmm. and then you wind up taking the long way home anyway because it's so fucking overwhelmingly enjoyable that you wind up doing a three hour drive when you didn't think you were going to make it to one, and you get home, you're an ex- exhausted. You need a hot tub, a massage, a jacuzzi, and a fucking cigarette, and I don't smoke. Second cigarette reference of the day. Do I need to start smoking again? I'd, no. be th- I'd be thin. Um, uh, 
but we've all talked about how cars like really violently experiential cars like that really make great classic cars mm -hmm. and that cars that are too good don't like mm -hmm. i don't like cars that are not an experience i don't like cars that are too good because they don't make a you know if i was gonna have one classic car it certainly wouldn't be a 126 mercedes benz because it's not enough of an experience to drive yeah, i agree is that gonna hurt this car in 20 years yeah, I worry about that. Or we might we might end up in a place where every car is so civilized that this will be described as raw. Mm. I don't think we're going to wind up in a, in a in a world where every car does one point six seconds zero to sixty. No, but the I mean, the, the cars might be so insular. This car mm. is not particularly insular, no. and I liked that about it. I, in terms of the feedback you get from the steering and the chassis, and mm -hmm. you hear pebbles and you hear the motors and stuff, it's not a terribly insular car. And so I could actually see in twenty yeah. years describing this car as raw. Yeah, which is a strange thing to say about an EV. I found a third bitch. Okay, I Here. want stalks instead of steering wheel buttons. Yeah. I mean, I, I was like, where the hell? The wipers, come on. There's wipers, turn signals, and the turn signal clicker yeah. is on the passenger side, so you can't hear it from the driver's side, and then the little light and whatever. Just give me a fucking stall. Yeah, I, I found it. That. I did it successfully. And, uh, three bitches. The car has some buttons in it, uh, more buttons than, than some cars has, but not a ton of buttons. So the philosophy was everything to do with driving was a real button, and everything to do with like infotainment is not. And I mm -hmm. think actually, so you have to go into a, a secondary menu to move the seats or steering wheel. And the mirrors. Yeah, and the mirrors. So luckily, I'm, I'm about the same size as the test driver, so I didn't really have to move much. But I thought, you know, do I really need to? How, what would a switch have cost? Well, um, and they can't be trying to save money. There, yeah, they could be. You think so? Yeah, everyone's always trying to save money. If you can save money, you have. But to if save you're going to develop your own stuff in house and mill your own knobs for the gear selector and stuff, I mean, I guess the, the OEMs response to that anytime i've said it has well listen people get in a car and they move they find their seat position and they don't change it bullshit i'm i'm often making changes i have a big huge thick jacket on i mean i like to sit pretty close to the wheel and so if i have a big huge thick jacket on maybe i'll go back one notch on the seat and just you know there's just sure I, i'm happy to have a memory setting but i don't think it should be that difficult to move mm. something number one um not that it was that difficult it worked pretty well and it was intuitive but i wouldn't have done it while i was driving Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of test mm -hmm. in a car with manual seats or, you know, anything. Unless it's one of the ones where you pull the lever up to the, and then slides backwards. You're like, where are the pedals gone? In. Yeah. Um, that I think I could do without the, that. Then the mode selectors are very big mm -hmm. and they're very, very tactile. My mm -hmm. problem with it is this is an earlier software version. I was told it was already changed, but it's sort laggy. Of they're lagging. They ignore a lot of your, yes. so the graphics they've changed. So we won't even get in that, but basically the, when you get in the car on the left side of the steering wheel is like uh, the gear selector. Uh, well, it's also the start button. Yes. So it's a rotating control with a button with a, with in a the screen middle. in the middle of it. Yeah. And so you press it once it starts the car and then you go PR and D. Um, I, what I suggested was if I, even if it's laggy and it hasn't registered it yet, I want four clicks over and then I want the button to stop. I don't want it to be yes. a, a hall effect, a button that turns endlessly. Yeah. Um, so I can just press the button, go to drive and the car will start and go into drive when it's ready. And I don't have to look over at a display and say, oh no, it only made it to end. Yes, Next I agree. One. Um, I agree with that feedback. There should be someone a, who is doing, doing a lot of maneuvering in the car. Yeah. I mean, at Polestar, my God. God did an amazing job on this on the latest version of the I have a Polestar 2 BST 270 whatever it was called and what I realized is in maneuvering is it, it will let you go into reverse while you're still moving so will Nevera because it was done by car people and then so you just go into reverse and there's no reverse gear in electric cars right they're just reversing the, the current in the motor and and your request for forward power becomes a request for rearward power so if you throw it in reverse while you're still moving forward under a certain speed adding gas just adds regen until you come to a stop and then and then we'll accelerate in the other direction. And I found that the Polestar was so unbelievably easy to maneuver because I could have my hand on the on the shifter and be moving forward, throw it in reverse, and then use the throttle to slow me down, go backwards, throw it into drive, and then use that to the gas pedal now to slow me down and accelerate forward. Uh, this that's car, luxury. it's fucking awesome. And if this car had that same definite stop mm -hmm. with an immediate reaction on the shifter it would be the same way because it's left hand you could just back into a parking spot or something yeah. and we're we are absolutely picking next, next yes year because, i mean if this is the kind of gripery that we're coming right, up with right but that's kind of like that's it it ends there i didn't notice if it has heated seats it does okay heated steering wheel uh i don't believe so do not buy a rim <laughs> until there's a heated steering wheel no, i don't know uh but yes it does have heated um, seats i used them 
uh, on our shoot day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, another gripe I have is that we were photographing it. We wanted to photograph with the wing up, but when mm. you put it in park, the wing goes down. And so I had to stay inside of the car with my, to leave it in drive in track mode to have the wing up to take photos. So I was just in there eating so cookies the, while Paula was taking photos. The test driver was like, no, 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 you can just leave it in gear and get out. And it I has did, auto hold. I did eventually discover that it would do that. But my God, with someone else's two and a half million dollar car, yeah, was exactly I just going to leave it in drive? He was in the car and I started to make fun. I'm like, hey, listen, there's no EPB. There's no electronic parking brake. He's like, well, there is. You just press that start, the gear selector start section in the middle. He's like, that's an EPB. And also you can throw it into, into park or reverse or whatever. And I'm like, but it's across the car. You can't reach it. And he's like, if the car takes off, die. I mean, he's, I, he's, he better not get in trouble for that. It was, he was just a really funny comment. He's like, ah, eh, well, it can't be perfect. Yeah. Um, so that was my other, yeah. my other gripe, but I did eat, um, Samoa's the Girl Scout cookies <laughs> while Paolo was photographing it for our shoot. So, so when you look at the, the video that you made for ACME, just everyone look in the video, you just watch Derek. <laughs> yeah, eating cookies. And you're the thin one. Uh, I mean, eating cookies for me, I think I had two. <laughs> Still, I had, of I had none. Uh, but yeah, so, what is, so we've completed your list of gripes. Yeah, that's kind of it. I mean, I don't want one because I don't want hypercars and I don't. Yeah. And I mean, do I get seven figures of value out of it? I mean, seven figures to me is very different from seven figures for someone who's going to buy this kind of car. Yeah. You know, I would much rather own this car than the vast majority of contemporary supercars that I've interacted with from the last 10 years. There is not a single automatic transmission super slash hypercar that I would even remotely consider owning or dealing with, period. And mm -hmm. so I think what this does is takes this this format to the next level, right? Uh, sure, if you have a screaming engine and a and a relatively short geared manual transmission and hydraulic steering and really interaction, I can get behind that, but I cannot get behind the modern computer controlled video games on wheels where you have millions of lines of code that are there to manage something that doesn't need to exist anymore. We're past that, it's over. Electricity has won the race, yeah, literally yeah. and figuratively. And this is the, this is the, the done proper. This is EV supercar slash hypercar done properly from yeah. my perspective. I just, yeah, would I rather have, I don't know, choose the thing. I would I'd rather have this than a P1. I'd rather have this than a 918. Yeah. I'd rather have this than, I mean. 918 makes some good noises. I mean, but it's an automatic. It's not, and it's not a noise that I like because it's flat plane. Mm, yeah. I, you know, I had no problem with it. I, I got a lot of jollies out of the Senna because it was so unhinged. But my God, I hate looking at it. And just McLaren generally is not a mark that I'm. Uh, McLaren, I can I can only love because of the steering. Hydraulic steering. I hate that engine. Yeah. I hate that transmission. Well, the transmission is okay, but I just hate that it's an automatic. Yeah. Um, there's nothing. Yeah, you're. I think you're right. There's nothing. I, I guess I have to compare it to a Chiron. Mm -hmm. And that's where you could look. You can see where the extra million plus goes. Right, the Chiron's interior. The Chiron is a piece of art. Yeah, it is rolling art. When you interact with it, you're just like, I am so poor. <laughs> That's the feeling I get when I get inside of a Chiron because you just it, everything is so beautiful. It's like yeah. walking into a museum or a beautiful house where you're just like, God, it's expensive in here. Yeah, like I'm gonna take my shoes off. Yeah, and then leave my socks on so my peasanty feet don't touch the ground yeah. and leave oil prints. Yeah. No, the, the Chiron is it. Y you can see. I mean, you can see. And it. it's interesting that they are now f like the same company. The company, yeah. That, and, and, you know, I quizzed them about this. They said these car companies will remain separate. You know, there will be crossover for technology wise, but they occupy very different places, right? The Remats is very contemporary. And that's one of the comments they make as a Croatian car company. We, you know, there's not any heritage that they're drawing on, whereas Bugatti is just the definition of heritage. It's, it's almost oppressive, the the hundreds of years of, of sort of like, it's a French chateau on wheels, even though it's very high tech. But and there's German. all of it. <laughs> and uh, German. <laughs> yeah, a German chateau. A, um, no. Schloss. 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 Is that the word? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, and so there is so much like awareness of the past and sort of retrospectiveness and thoughtfulness and orientation towards where the heritage in a Bugatti and this car is co totally contemporary. I think Bugatti fucked up with you. I think the Chiron's wonderful. I think it's a huge step up from Veyron, which I had a tremendous amount of respect for to begin with. Um, but the Chiron should have been electric. And I think if the Chiron had this powertrain in it, it would have resurrected it would have cemented that brand's future and i don't think Chiron did mm. um 
I th- I think that they, I mean, obviously with the tie up, it's entirely possible that that could lie in the future, but then they sort of are sort of stepping on each other uh, potentially a little bit. But like I said, yeah. one is an object of art that's very past oriented, mm-hmm. and you know, is the it other, though? I mean, I wonder. I guess my question is: Has they Bugatti want been to draw held? on it? They, they do, want, but to, other than styling cues, has that car really been been held back by its? That's heritage? not held back. I don't mean held back. Okay. I just mean that it is it is defined by it. It is an integral part of its identity because mm. the aesthetics and a lot of the uh, sensory experience that you have as an occupant or walking up to the car mm. is really defined by cues from the past. There's so much of the Ventu language with the curved shape on the side That's of the car so, and the yeah. two tone schemes and mm-hmm. the execution of leather and inside the car. I mean, it's really like a modern coach built car in terms yeah. of that execution and this is like totally high tech mo- the nevera is very high tech and modern and contemporary by comparison and so you know if you imagine a world in which they both exist they're serving sort of different they're scratching different itches mm-hmm. one is very you know like i said it's a piece of art and uh the other is sort of a sh- technology showcase right I, I don't know if I agree with the decision to have the next Bugatti be hybrid. hybrid? Yeah. I, I think that's a... Because that, that's like a wacky ten years compromise. Ago, ten years ago, that should have been the case. And look, I just got an, a ride in the E-Ray. Um, that is a hybrid sports car, and it is way faster than a um, than than a Stingray. We talked about this, right? In the, did we talk maybe, about this? Yeah, we, Maybe possible. we talk about it next episode. episode? I don't know. Um, but you know, the idea of a hybrid sports car is wonderful. Hybrid, hybrid car is wonderful, whatever, but I think it's time has come. And I think I would have loved for Bugatti to be ahead of the curve instead of behind. And I think at this point going hybrid is behind the curve. I do appreciate them for giving a hell of a send off to internal combustion. I mean, what a way to go. I mean, sure. But you know, we just have a, we just had a 1,025 horsepower rear wheel drive challenger debut yeah last week when when are we filming this last week it had done debuted i i mean that's a hell of a send-off that that w16 is brutal in the in the chiron in ways that it wasn't in the veyron right it's violent it feels it it sounds it um but it's still got nothing on a big v8 um and so it's a wonderful send-off in terms of power but maybe not in terms of involvement i i would say that gordon murray's t50 yes t- yeah right, those yes, yes. are a send-off too yeah i guess i just meant the powertrain yeah. is a hell of a way to say goodbye to internal combustion just because it's the numbers the, the sophistication of it is sure. just but give me give me a ferrari v12 give me i mean if lamborghini has a new v12 like this is fucking insane the first one lasted 50 years the second one lasted 10 and, and now we got to the third end one? of the murcielago so yeah 1963 to 2011 right fucking nuts it was yeah. 50 years yeah. years makes no difference and the yeah. second one lasted 10 11 12 they're like okay and now we do a whole new v12 again yes because even though i hate that aventador is v12 from when in the car outside it's best sounding car ever made and so I, that's why I think like, okay, if the point of that Bugatti is to be an object of art, of a Chiron, object of art that's with incredible performance, well, make it, re, give it refinement and make yeah. it electric. Yeah. And I would love to see a Chiron EV. Um, and I think it's... Or a, some Bugatti flagship EV that's yeah. not a hybrid. Yeah. But um, yeah. Maybe the generation after. Uh, very cool. Anyway, yeah, an altogether remarkable car that we actually didn't hate. It's tremendously impressive. It's really well rendered. It's just a world-class product. I showed up in a lease and I wasn't bored. Yeah. In an electric car. That's saying something. Yep. True. Got back in the Elise and I was (laughs) bruised from my tits hitting me myself in the face (laughs) over bumps. Like, the bumps weren't even here a minute ago. Yeah, it was a cool experience. All right. That has been episode number. We didn't hate it. We rather liked it. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, episode number eight. Uh, uh, I think this is 89. 89? Yeah, yeah. episode okay. 90 will be next week, maybe. I don't know, we were late last week. Sorry mm. about that, everyone. Pregnancy oh. scare. Uh, <laughs> also, just maybe I liked it. I think I wrote in the, in the comments on YouTube, so I was like, why is it so late? And I'm like, because Monday morning at 8 o'clock my time is a really shitty time to launch a podcast. Uh, I think I'm going to suggest we move this away from Monday morning at 8 a.m., maybe mm. Monday afternoon, maybe Tuesday. Um, write some things in the comments if you feel very strongly about this. But, like, I really don't think it matters what day we launch. Like, yeah, it's great that we could launch, you know, on a Monday and you guys have something to do while you're supposed to be at work on Monday. But, dude, fucking writing titles and descriptions on a Sunday is, like... Yeah. I don't like that. 
I mean, some podcast is better than no podcast. One could argue that maybe I should get that done on Friday, to which I say, please not do something at the last minute. Do you have any idea who I am? Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode. We'll see you for the next one. A part of the Haggerty Podcasting Network. <laughs> or similar.